that's all going. And we'll make a start. Uh, I'll introduce you, Wendy. Um, morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to another fleet seminar. We've got Professor Rogers talking to us today about understanding research of values to build better scientific outcomes. Uh, Wendy works in the field of Oh, I suppose it's practical bioethics, as she describes it, um, with doing research that, or her research relevant to today's talk is, I'll read it out, characterised by identifying practical problems, undertaking conceptual analysis of the underlying philosophical and ethical issues, and developing responses that advance knowledge and contribute to a practice. Um, she's got a lot of awards to her name, and I'm not going to read all of them out. There's a big long list, and they're on the on the website post for this event. But I'll hand it over to you, Wendy, to take it away. Okay, thanks, Jason, and um, good morning, everyone. Before I start, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm on the the lands of the Camaragal people of the Eora Nation here in um, West Chatswood in Sydney, and I pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. And um, I also acknowledge that we're we're on various diverse lands around the country attending the seminar today. So what I'm going to talk about today is um, a project I've done with the Center of Excellence that I'm involved with, which is a Center of Excellence on um, synthetic biology. And we, as part of the work that I did with one of my postdocs at the beginning of the center was um, a qualitative study looking at um, what the researchers mot motives were for doing their research, what they saw as the ethical issues um, and, and um, how they saw the context in which they did their research affecting the kinds of things that they could do. Um, and out of that, we've we've kind of taken the research in a couple of ways. So what I want to talk about today um, just is, is the the values work that's come out of that. I'm just going to speak very briefly about you know what values are, uh, and then I'll describe the qualitative study that we did in the Center of Excellence. And uh, during that study, we we looked at three sort of families of values uh, related to the motivation to do good science. Um, related to the actual practice of science and and values that were described more in terms of character traits or um, virtues, we might say, of what they're called good scientists. Um, and then we kind of took a slight turn to left field to try and work out a way of communicating our findings effectively with the centre, given that, you know, a lot of the scientists weren't particularly um, sort of interested in philosophy and ethics and so forth, um, working at a, often at a molecular level. So we developed an animation in order to try and communicate our findings more effectively. And I want to finish up by spending some time um, in discussion about the kinds of, I, I guess I'll be interested to know whether the values that were relevant to the scientists in the um, Synthetic Biology Centre have any resonance with scientists in your center with researchers in your center um, and if so I've got sort of um, some specific questions to ask about what kinds of values come up and, and how these might impede or further the the work that you're doing but that's, those are the four areas that I'll be covering today first of all what are values um, values is one of those terms that you know is is uh, um, bandied around a lot. It can be a little bit hard to pin down. But when we're talking about values, we're talking about um, evaluate about whether we think something is good or bad, better or worse. Um, and they can be understood as fundamental principles that that guide or motivate people to think or act in particular ways. So, for example, if you um, value conservation, you might spend time doing bush care work to get weeds out of um, native bush to try and preserve and, and conserve that native bush for the value because you value that. Um, Values are the basis we use for attributing worth, for assessing whether something's worthwhile or meaningless, good or bad, right or wrong. And those terms can apply to all sorts of things. They don't just apply to um, moral values. So we might, um, you know, we might um, value a car because it accelerates quickly and we have particular driving needs where we need to accelerate quickly. Um, or we, we might value, you know, one um, savings account because it gives more interest than another one. So we, the values aren't necessarily moral in nature. But when we're talking about a moral nature, we are more concerned with broader questions of good or bad or right or wrong rather than just better or worse. Um, 
which which we can apply to most things when I mean, we can when we when we choose a flavor of ice cream for example you know i always choose chocolate climate value mm-hmm. chocolate flavor more than the other flavors um, so you can see values can be quite trivial like the ice cream one or quite fundamental driving people to take up particular professions for example or to donate to particular charities or to use their time in particular ways there's a, a long um a history of scholarship on values in science. Um, and here there's been, you know, debates gone various ways over the years. That I think there's general agreement that there are what we call epistemic values in science. So these are to do with generating knowledge, generating reliable, accurate knowledge. So one of the things that distinguishes um, science from you know, journalism or fiction or cooking uh, is that in in science we're looking for theories that have predictive accuracy we're looking for explanatory power we're looking for consistency um, if we do an experiment today we want it to have the same outcome as tomorrow if we do in, do it in an identical way so so that we can rely on the knowledge that's generated by our, our actions in science so these epistemic values are sort of fairly hardwired into science and and most people doing science would would think that when they're choosing their methods and when they're actually doing the work that they are trying to protect those values so that they do get accurate work that predicts um, consistently and that has um, explanatory power. And these are sometimes kind of caught, you know, referred to as, you know, the objectivity of science, that science is very objective. And that's often contrasted to values and you know, like values are sometimes seen as subjective, whereas, um, you know, science is objective and there's no room for emotion in there. But of course, that's not, not, not the whole story, because as well as these epistemic values, which do try and... Um, produce a level of objectivity. There are also non-epistemic values in science, and these can be ethical or political or ideological. Um, and I've just been enjoying reading um, Eliot's, um, some of Eliot's book, A Tapestry of Values. And he's got a really interesting um, introductory chapter um, in that book where he's talking about values in um, in Russian science and how, the, how um, as the ideology changed in science, um, the genetic geneticism became out of favor and lysenkoism came into favor. And, and we, we can also see those kind of um, values in play when we look at research done, for example, by um, big tobacco. So their ideological concerns to preserve the, the profit making of, of big tobacco led them to do research, particular types of research, whereas people without those concerns did, did different research. And we've seen again, the, the sort of thing is ethical, political and ideological um, concerns have all shaped the debate about the, the meaning of the research in climate change, for example. So on the one hand, we've got this view of science as very objective, um, but accurate, explanatory. And on the other hand, science takes place in the world done by human beings with particular ideological commitments, with particular ethical concerns um, and so forth. And Eliot in his book argues that values can play a positive role in science by providing, for example, the inspiration to pursue certain topics by directing the questions and methods that researchers use and determining the amount of evidence they demand before drawing conclusions. And um, my background's in medicine, so certainly the, the evidence um, questions of evidence have been very relevant. And this whole notion of evidence-based medicine has, has come from people valuing um, particular findings from particular sorts of research. But values in science can be problematic as well because they can lead to the suppression of important ideas, they can result in biased interpretations, and they can cause researchers to mislead the public about the state of scientific research. Um, for example, if people don't want to explain their results because they think people might be frightened by them or worried by them. Um, and Elliot's got some, some great examples in his book, if you have time to, to take a look at that. So that's just a, a little bit of background about values. So we're, we're kind of on the same page, what we're talking about. So then why, why study um, researchers' values in the centre of excellence? Um, and I think there's a few reasons that we thought it would be a useful 
project to do. The first was, was purely descriptive um, to try and identify the range of values held by the researchers um, in case that, you know, there might have been some ones that we were surprised by. There might have been some quite strong themes um, so that we would be able to make generalizations about what the scientists held in common in, in terms of the values. And having done this, this could potentially assist with the identification and resolution of, of values-based conflicts. Um, and here you might see values-based conflicts in terms of prioritizing particular research questions or projects because you know, researchers inevitably have more ideas than there is funding to actually do the work. Um, and so you have to make choices, you have to priority set. And values are often at play in that because um, you they provide a reason for you choosing one particular type of research rather than another. And, and it might be that, you, you know, you value rapid publication um, because you need that publication on your CV. So you choose a particular type of research that's more likely to get you there. Um, we hoped that the research would foster a sense of shared values within the COE, and so that was really important when we were when we were um, communicating our results. We we wanted to show that there were common that we found that there were values held in common. We wanted to to showcase those. We also wanted to stimulate reflection and debate um, when when you're at the bench. So we were told by the scientists, and you're you know busy with you know, lysing your organisms and, you know, finding enzymes and, and, and putting them through the machines and so forth. There's not a lot of time or space to think about why you're doing what you're doing um, and some of the broader implications. Um, and we also hoped that the, the results of our research might be useful in terms of informing high level values based decision making. And that might be about what kinds of partnerships to pursue, for example. So how did we do this? How did we um, investigate the, the values held by the researchers in the COE? We did a, a qualitative study, um, and this involved fairly standard qualitative research. We recruited people through a bulk email out to all centre members, and we used investigator networks, snowballing, which is asking people to recommend other people, and internal communications in the centre. We um, we were open to participants from all all levels and all roles across the centre. So we had chief investigators, um, early and mid career researchers, PhDs, and um, professional staff resident in Australia. And the interviews were semi structured um, on Zoom because this was in 2020 during COVID, and they were 60 to uh, um, 120 minutes long. The interview was quite broad ranging, but um, towards the end of the interview, after um, participants had already talked about the work that they were doing and talked about potential ethical issues and so on. We then had three specific questions about values to do with how and why people chose the projects that they did, um, what they considered to be high quality synthetic biology research, the features of that, and also the qualities of, of who they of a person they would recognize as a good synthetic biologist. Uh, we had 31 participants, um, three of them were interviewed twice for a total of 34 interviews, and we did um, standard qualitative, inductive and deductive thematic analysis. So, and I'm happy to, if people got questions about the methods, I'm happy to, to, to speak to those later. In terms of what did we find, we found three main value categories. So values um, are related to the motivation to do do science, values internal to science and values um, are referring to the virtues of good scientists. And you'll have noticed that we asked questions on those. So you might say, well, you, you found what you were looking for. But we also had a lot more data apart from those three questions, which we found did cluster into the into um, um, these three main value categories. So we were, we were both um, having open-ended questions at the beginning of the interviews and then more um, specific ones. And we found that the values that were expressed in the open-ended, more open-ended part of the interview were um, easily fitted into and consistent with the three value groups that we'd put in our sort of a priori questions. So I'll just give you some quotes here to just sort of run you through um, what, yeah, what, what, the, what was meant, what was the content of these actual um, clusters of values. So the first was to do with the values related to the motivation to do good science and material in this category, um, you know, sort of overlapped with aspirations. Um, people had expressed 
for the hopes that the synthetic biology would do good in the world. And the majority of participants in the interview of the majority of the 31 talked about their motives for doing good science. And this seemed to be quite an accessible way to talk about values. Whereas when we actually asked the values question, people were sometimes a bit perplexed about what we meant by values. And we um, identified sort of three um, types of values associated with the motivation to, to do good synthetic biology. So people said things like, um, you know, I do value research that has real world application, in particular that addresses current societal or environmental issues. I value science that has a strong problem solving component. Um, you know, I guess all of the research is underpinned by this idea we're helping the world to be better. We're going to improve the lives of others or the health of the globe. So these were the, um, that's the number one there, the public good. So people were speaking about their motivation to do science to actually, you know, do good in the world. Um, and the way that was cashed out was in terms of improving lives, improving health, environmental um, issues um, and solving problems, whatever the problems might be. Um, and there was, of course, a bit of a focus on practical issues. People said things like, from my perspective, good science is science that can make a difference in the real world. So it's sort of a bit of a, a push against perhaps purely theoretical research towards applied research. And that's not surprising because we're an applied um, synthetic biology centre. Um, the second theme that people um, talked about was advancing scientific knowledge. And I think that reflects the value placed on knowledge, irrespective of its um, applications. So people said things like, I'm a strong believer in knowledge for knowledge um, sake, and that you can have good science that doesn't lead to any sort of direct outcome. And I think it's really important science to do as well. Um, and there's value in critical exploration, even if you don't know what the ends are going to be. Um, and again, that's not surprising that people would say things like this, because you know, a lot of science is curiosity driven. Um, this is still a, a you know, strong passion for blue skies research where people can just try and find out stuff, understand stuff, even if there isn't an obvious practical application. Um, and both of those themes, the public good and knowledge, were, were supported by a large number of participants. Fewer people talked about avoiding harm. They, they talked about um, wanting their research to, to not not be used for harm. So there's always that kind of dual use issue with, with research. Um, and people said things like, um, you know, good science is something that solves a problem but doesn't make other problems. And another person said the quote, which is on the slide, you know, you're faced with this question of, okay, I know at least in the early days, this is going to be used equally poorly or badly. Then should I not research this thing at all? But in the long run, it would probably benefit people. So, so, there was that sort of tension if there was a potential for the research to cause harm, um, but still um, with potential for long-term benefit. The second cluster of values was to do with the values internal to science, what good science is. And here, um, again, there was a lot of consistency in this character, uh, in this um, category. And people talked about objectivity, definitely one of the biggest values. Um, it's uh, important to be 100% objective when you're trying to explore something from a scientific perspective. There's an underlying truth we're trying to discover. It's not like it's someone's perspective. And then the more controlled your experiment, the stronger your assertions can be and the more certainty you can have. So here, you know, I think people are, re are referring to the, those epistemic values that I mentioned um, at the beginning of the presentation. This, you know, the, the, the need to do science that is reliable and can be predictable and so forth. Um, there was a dissenter uh, out of the people we interviewed who said that they think scientific objectivity is a construct and they don't think that anyone's truly objective. Um, but that was, that was a, a lone voice that most of the other participants talked about objectivity. And they um, talked about, um, you know, the way that objectivity was linked to the scientific method as that bottom quote um, is getting at the more controlled your experiment, um, the more certainty you can have. And these views reflect the that that um, notion that, that that science is free from sort of you know messy everyday real world values, the non epistemic values, and this idea that the truth is out there waiting to be discovered, and that well designed experiments will lead to the truth. Um, so that was certainly a strong view amongst the participants. The third category was values as personal qualities. 
Um, and we put those into five clusters that they, it was it was messy data that we probably could have cut it in different ways, but we just were trying to um, bunch together things that seemed similar. So passion, creativity, and curiosity was was um, one of the values, and, and people spoke a lot about this, you know, about the need to really care about what you're doing and to have curiosity and imagination, you know, learn about the world. Um, and people talked about it being an artistic form of biology because you're physically designing and creating something. Um, so this, um, which Matt perhaps I saw as different to other forms of science, like in you know maybe astronomy, you're describing things, but you're not able to design things the way that you can can in um, synthetic biology. A second uh, key character value was or cluster were to do with resilience, industriousness, and ambition. Uh, so this idea that you have to um, be willing to take the initiative and to take responsibility. Um, perseverance was seen as critical. If it, you go into something knowing that the first maybe five times you have at it, you're all going to fail and you can't take that to heart. Um, and the importance of being hardworking, driven, determined, um, and one person characterised that as sheer bloody-minded determination. So humility and honesty was a, was a third category. Um, people talked about the necessity of being able to divorce your ego from the work you're doing. And people talked about integrity as well and humility. Um, integrity was seen as, as, as really important in terms of protecting the, the value of the results. Um, the fourth category was collaboration, diversity and teamwork. But you need to be able to work with other people to be able to achieve any kind of result. You need a mixture of people. Um, and you need to be open to collaboration and crit criticism. Um, so teamwork came through very well. I mean, I guess the people who were the lone wolves were less likely to be in the study, but um, certainly this, this category had a, a lot of support. And the final one was community and engagement. Um, one of the people said that's one of the values, right? Imparting knowledge to people. Uh, another one said the other part of good science is how it's communicated to the research community. Good science, not just about the experiment and the results, but it's how it's communicated. And people did mention the challenge of of, of poor communication um, leading to you know public mistrust of science. Okay, that all sounds very kind of wholesome, if you like. So far, those values are all ones I think we would you know probably be able to endorse or endorse the majority of them. But of course, we, we've described three different families of values and within those different um, different specific values in each cluster. And with this many, inevitably they can come into conflict. And that's what our um, participants spoke about of barriers or conflicts that threatened the realization of the values um, related to um, achieving public good from science and to doing good science. So the, the first um, set of conflicts were about on the pressures to do good science. Um, one person said a lot of people don't accept negative results. So if your experiment fails, it's looked poorly upon rather than if you're honest in saying your experiment failed. People just don't accept it. So there's that fear of being blamed if your research didn't work out. Um, another one mentioned being purely output focused and particular focused. You're never going to find out the things that are really revolutionary and important. Um, participant 30 had a fairly you know, grim view. <laughs> Unfortunately, almost nothing in the scientific system in encourages integrity. So what I mean is like we value people writing papers more than other things. It's not okay to take five years and have negative data. Um, and then the final person said, I'm always amazed at how not terrible science is given the conflicts of interest. Um, and I thought this was interesting. I don't know if people saw today in the paper, um, there's an article about Australian universities and research metrics and, and the problematic nature of, of you know, sort of valuing um, publication metrics to the point that it drives what kind of research you do. And certainly that was something that we'd found in our in this project. A second place where the values were in conflict were the pressures for, from commercial funding. So I'm not sure what the situation is in fleet, but in our center, we've got a lot of commercial partners and, um, you know, the federal government is interested in research partnerships um, that bring in money. So this caused problems for some of our, uh, um, our, some of our researchers. Because when you have the market involved, your goal kind of shifts. Yeah. And the money kind of dictates what the goal is. 
then it kind of pits all of the different areas of research against each other. Um, another person said it's completely for commercial gain as well as, I guess, for status and how good it looks for you with all these patents you have. But it's pointless in what it achieves. I think what these people were talking about and, and it came out you know, clearly in the broader interview was that there's a lot of pressure to get a patent. There's a lot of pressure to have an industry partnership. But then that really changes the type of science you do because it's got to have a quick outcome it means that you can't necessarily publish because it's commercial in confidence and it means that you might be um turning your skills to something that you see as, as a bit trivial so for for example in synthetic biology there's you know commercial interest in synthetic flavors and and food colors and so on that might be cheaper than the naturally occurring ones or just have novelty value but for scientists that are really passionate about, you know, climate change, for example, and, and you know, having a, a you know, a, a different flavor of, of some food, it seems quite trivial um, compared to the things that they really care about. But at the same time, they've got these pressures to actually um, form commercial partnerships um, and, and get the patents and so forth. So commercial funding certainly was an issue for our researchers. Um, and then in terms of doing science for the public good, there was a bit of um, disoverlaps with the, the, the commercial research. Um, but there was a worry that, you know, you're, you're doing your work and it benefits the company and not society. Um, and the, this concern about trust as well and, and the disparity between the general public and scientists and the, the distrust, which was described as huge distrust, because we're not explaining our science in a manner that's easy to understand. And even when science is communicated to the public, it's often communicated wrong. Um, there's a lack of scientific knowledge in the general public and it's hard to take. And because of that lack of understanding, it's hard to take the research as far as you'd want to go or as far as it could go. So there's a lot in that quote. I mean, they're claiming that the, scienti the scientists aren't good at communicating and that perhaps the public's not good at understanding. Um, and then you lose social license to do some of the research that might actually be truly beneficial. Um, and this is, comes up in that third quote then, you know, the societal relevance and balancing what that means. Um, you know, scientists wanted some independence from the whims of the public and what they might like or not like, but also um, felt that they have to be responsible. Okay, so we, we reflected on our findings. Um, you know, we did find a widespread and um, potentially naive optimism at times about the potential value of synthetic biology to contribute to public good. Um, participants embraced but were largely uncritical of the value-free ideal of science um, and aspired to do research that benefited the society or the planet. Um, but I just wanted to sort of just sort of bring out um, three points. And, and as, this I see is tension. So the participants clearly identify the tensions that can compromise good science. You know, we've just talked about those. But despite that, they kind of clung on to this idea of the value-free idea of science. Um, and the, the underlying thread seemed to be that if the context um, to do with funding amount and career pressures and so forth, despite that, they could still do objective and value-free science. Um, so they, they, they recognised the tension but felt that it was still possible to, to, to quarantine the science from, from the, the, the external values, the social, political, economic and moral values. Um, and they were seen, these were seen as potential contaminants rather than, I guess, the way I would see it. They're an essential part of science. You can't do science without a social, moral, political, economic context. Um, so to, the challenge is to open up discussions about what values are, are exerting pressure and so on um, and, and link these to the questions of how you can do science for the public good. Um, the second thing we wanted to note was it was difficult talking about values. The, the scientists, you know, wanted to know what we meant by values at times. Um, and I think, you know, people, scientists get a bit anxious when you've got ethicists hanging around in case they say they're doing something wrong or something bad. Um, so there's a lack, and there's also a lack of practice about talking about values. 
Um, but if we want science to be, you know, for the public good to realize the, the values that the scientists themselves hold, then we need to talk about the values and we need to talk about the challenges in, in realizing those values. Otherwise, we're just going to kind of get stuck. Um, we need reflection to distinguish whether there are values, conflicts and how these can be navigated. Um, and thirdly, we, we wanted to we wondered about what to do with our findings, um, because, you know, we'd already given a couple of seminars to the centre, um, centre membership more broadly, but we found communication was challenging people uh, because we use concepts that are not familiar to people by and large. Um, and there is, I think, this sort of perception that the ethicists might try and find something wrong and try and stop everything. Um, so these were these were things we took into consideration, um, and we thought, well, how can we make make the best use of this? What can we do that will be useful, um, and and how can we communicate it? So we did something that's possibly a little bit unusual. We um, decided to make an animation. I'm just going to play a couple of minutes. Either either oops, didn't play here. I'm going to. Um, switch to a screen where it'll play. Okay, is that playing? Hi, Lily. Hi, Charlie. What are you working on? Ah, you know, microbes. And why do you study microbes, Charlie? Why'd you ask? Because I'm studying scientists to find out why they do what they do. Well, it's a good thing to do. What is there to study? Whether science is a good thing to do or not depends on your values. Uh, values? Yep. They're what motivates you and tells you what's right and wrong, what's a good project and what's not. We need to know what values are shaping big projects like the COE. OK. So what are our centre's values? Well, I've been asking COE scientists why they do what they do. Take a look. I do science to promote well-being and solve problems. I do science to discover new knowledge. I do science to avoid harm. Another values question is, how do you do good science? Good science is objective. Good science is rigorous. And reproducible. And then the third really important question is, how do you be a good scientist? You need passion, creativity and curiosity. You need humility and honesty. You need to be collaborative, but there also needs to be good communication and leadership. Oh, uh, you also need the resilience and determination to hang on in there. We worked out three categories for values, motives, personal and scientific and found factors that support or undermine them. <laughs> that sounds like my job. Working out what makes microbes thrive or not do so well. Exactly. Okay, I'll um, I'll I'll uh, I won't play the whole video. It goes for about six minutes, but I'll just talk about what comes next. So, in the first bit that you saw, the researcher um, Lily is explaining what she's been doing, talking to the bench scientists, and she's sort of talking about we need to know what the values are so we can support them in the centre. And he has this kind of light bulb moment, and he imagines it is at a conference that that he's the values are like microbes and he's looking after them um, in the way that he looks after his microbes on the bench. And so we came up with this metaphor of a, of a microbiome, a, a values microbiome. And we um, had a microbiologist on the on the team making the video. So we used three species of, of, of um, three real species of microbes, Pseudomonas, Helicobacter and Saccharomyces. But we gave them um, the second part of their name were to were after the value, so Pseudomonas motivatus, Helicobacter scientifica, and Saccharomyces characteri. So this was to sort of appeal to the microbiologists in the centre. And we thought the microbiome metaphor was, you know, we, we chose it because it's pluralistic, it's dynamic, um, it's, it's, people understand that you have to 
pay care and attention to the microbiome to make it flourish. So we, um, in the in the video, we talk about um, we describe the values in terms of these the family, the Pseudomonas family, and uh, the sources of the funding challenges. And so, in this still from the movie, that we talk about two sources of funding and how um, there's government funding and industry funding. And if we have too much industry funding, the um, the Pseudomonas um, motivators to do with you know um, knowledge creation that it goes kind of brown and dies because all the money's going for applied research and commercial research. Um, and, and this was kind of getting to the point that industry goals may not align with scientists values in terms of doing good. Um, the Helicobacter um, scientifica were, were representing the scientific values. Helicobacter are bacteria that live in the stomach and they protect themselves from that hostile environment with layers of mucus. So we were we were saying, OK, for for people to do good science, to protect those scientific values, we need to protect, um, protect scientists with secure employment, with acceptance of failure, with realizing that science can be slow. Oops. Um, sorry, um, with reducing publication pressures and, and by, you know, embracing teamwork. Um, and the third group of values was to do with um, the character. And we had um, Saccharomyces characterized. Saccharomyces is yeast, and it's one of the major organisms used. And we wanted to show that the, you know people might hold these virtues dear, the ones that we talked about. Um, but at the same time, there might be biases and power imbalances that, that influences or undermines those. Okay, so having um, done the present, you know, created the animation and presented it to the centre at a centre-wide meeting and so on. Um, we got some feedback, but not a lot. And so we decided to do a, a, a survey. Um, and two of the questions in the survey were just checking on the validity of the research findings portrayed in the animation. You know, we asked people, how relevant are the values in the animation to your research? And how many um, of the impediments to realising the values of potential conflicts do you face? Um, we had 53 people um, completing the surveys. 92% um, reported that the animation values were relevant or highly relevant to their work. And 81% reported they faced many or all of the potential impediments to these values. Um, and we think this is useful information for the, you know, for members of the centre and for the centre leadership, because um, it points to, to places where we might want to put some time and effort into protecting the values that people you know find found highly important and addressing the the barriers or impediments to realizing some of them okay so that's that's basically the, the project um I think I'd just I'd sort of like to finish by sort of remarking that um social and ethical values are are essential uh, and unavoidable in many central aspects of scientific reasoning. And when these legitimate influences are um, ignored, science still ends up being value laden, but the influences aren't subjected to adequate scrutiny or discussion. And I think that's a that's a really important point because we can't we we can't understand the influence unless we we really identify and recognise those values. Um, I'm very happy to open up for discussion now. Um, but what I what I thought you know might might maybe be helpful or interesting for the discussion is um, to talk about the the values in practice in fleet um, and you know from 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 my work you know I think we can identify a number of potential roles for values in terms of priority setting, methodological deciding how to study a particular topic or the focus what the specific aims of specific scientific inquiries are. Um, you know, how we respond to uncertainty. That's, that's quite a value-laden question there, how we, you know, whether we over or underplay our findings, for example, um, and then communicative deciding how to describe and frame and communicate results. So I'm happy to leave that slide up if we have discussion or if people want to, you know, grab a, a screenshot of it and and um and then we can just see see talk to each other <laughs> albeit a small postage size people. Um Jason, I'm happy to take whatever advice you think would work best for, for the discussion. 
Uh, yeah, well, I've got some questions, but uh, I'll open it up to anyone else if anyone wants to speak to that slide there or has other questions. Um, let them go first. Yeah, I, I had a question I wanted to ask. Hi, I'm Matt Davis of the University of Queensland. Um, so, I mean, a lot everything that you said sort of, you know, rung true for, for me. And I guess the question I had is that I kind of feel like almost everything that you said is like an overriding, the overriding aspects across all of science. I was just wondering if you had any comment about the sort of variation that there might be between different fields and, and so on, because I, I felt I could take pretty much everything you said and apply it to fleet, for example. Yeah, look, thanks, Matthew. That's a really good question. So um we were we were we tried to keep it on synthetic biology um but i think i think you're right it was very it was i think the value the things that the results we came up with are largely generalizable i mean a couple of caveats in there um i think the commercial funding the commercial pressure is is a really big one in and you know the arc centers of excellence perhaps go like that i mean i'm not i know they funded one on astronomy um, I, I kind of can't see the commercial pressures in astronomy so much. You're not, um, you know, you're not making things that might have commercial benefit. So, and, you know, and I think there are possibly some areas of science where those um, the societal pressures that will be different. Um, but yeah, I, I agree with you, and and that's been it's been interesting because you know we we started looking at the ethics of synthetic biology and what people said were the ethics of synthetic biology and most and the you know some of the one of the key distinguishing features there was this question of playing god and making life and are we creating organisms and disrupting people's relationships with nature and so on but that wasn't really an issue for people in our center they weren't concerned about that um they were more concerned about you know this you know the difficulty of finding a job and just trying to you know pick projects that that would almost guarantee to be successful rather than ones that they necessarily cared passionately about um so yeah yeah no good point thank you all, all these things sound very uh common just with the the gravitational wave center there's a lot of instrumentation in that and i i would suspect that there's some sort of commercial angles to that i, I don't know for certain but uh, it's surprising even things you think are fundamental is actually there are angles where there can be, um, you know, sort of commercial pressures. Um, yeah, that's a good point. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah, and and when you mentioned about the, um, you know, creating life, I guess you know physicists have a, a similar sort of uh, concern about working with defence and creating technologies that you know, you know, can lead to use as weapons and things like that. So you know, there are all these similarities, even though the fields are so different. I think it's quite interesting. And actually, the one other thing I'd say is that. It's quite good hearing it all put together in one point because these are all things that you sort of vaguely think about, but it's not often you don't often think about it. And so putting it in front of people, I think, is actually really valuable. So it's a shame there weren't a few more people here this morning. Yeah, look, thanks. I think I mean that's the feedback I've had from the scientists in our center is that they just don't have they don't have the the time and they don't have the you know the the, the the conceptual tools or training to sort of pull things together I and mean, that that's why you yeah. need ethicists in a project to try and to do that work um and so it, it, i think they find it interesting they think okay yeah no yeah i hadn't thought about that but yeah you're right actually there that is a problem or potentially a problem or whatever so yeah thank you i, I won't i'll let other people say something <laughs> i'll jump in if that's okay, I, I was what Matt said is kind of the overarching uh, sort of rationale to what my next question is, which is drilling down in a little bit. Um, I, I noticed there was in a couple of those slides, I've got two sort of questions related to each other. You, the scientists were saying that there's always they struggle with and they uh, and there's a need with their science. The, because of there's this problem with trust there's problem with that people don't understand the science that we need to communicate to the public um we need to impart the knowledge our knowledge to the public and i am wondering if that's just uh, a what would you call it a, a, a natural use of the language with them actually thinking that because the way i work in this space is that we need there's that that communicating to public is a very deficit model way of thinking that and a linear thing that if we just take our knowledge and we give it to the public then they will that's in a way that they to build trust for them to accept what we're doing and so on where in reality 
we need to communicate with the public because our science is complex. It's very much value laden. It's, it's, it's systems thinking sort of approach that doesn't work with that linear. Let's just communicate our knowledge. So I'm wondering, is um, do you think the scientists uh, really have that that way of thinking that we just need to communicate to the public and problems will be solved, or is it just this a slip of how they're using the language? I think it's a bit of both, um, Jason. And the reason I say that is because a, a lot of people um, in the centre, not just in these interviews, but just in general conversation and so on, very wary of and worried about what happened with um, the backlash against genetically modified organisms. Um, and so that was seen as, um, you know, we don't want to fall into that trap again. We need to communicate. We need to, you know, we, we're not Monsanto. We're not just trying to, you know, invent, you know, seeds with seeds with suicide genes. So you have to, you know, so you buy new ones every year. And, you know, we, we're not rapacious like that. We're actually trying to do good because that that the the what the scientists saw as the misunderstanding by the public of, of genetically mo modified organisms and the potential dangers of them had really put the field back a long way. Um, I mean, there's a lot you can say there. You know, I think people, the way that the the commercial uptake of some of that GMO um, stuff, you know, was was rapacious and unconscionable, and so people were right to kind of, you know, be wary of it and and and, and so forth. So I think there is a perception that there's a public misunderstanding that needs to be corrected on the one hand, but I think there's also, you know, we've got an excellent you know, communications team in the center who, who, you know, doing a lot of outreach and trying to have very engaging conversations with rather than, than you know, talking at people. Um, so I think there's two things going on there. There's the historic legacy of, of, the, of the feeling that, you know, genetic, you know, genetic modification of organisms in beneficial ways was completely misunderstood and completely drowned out by the, the sort of the Monsanto approach um, and also the need to really get people on board, um, get people engaged with what we're doing so that we can, you know, hopefully on the commercial side, create products that are going to be, you know, of useful or that people will value. Um, yeah, I mean, I've, you know, I've but, worked with Mary and I've seen what she does, yes, and it's very much along those lines with me. And I just thought, well, maybe, you know, this is what, what the Marys and Errols and, me of the world need to work a lot more harder to work with the scientists to change that um, mindset of how we communicate, um, engage the public in a dialogue about the, the research rather yeah. than that, 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 that linear transfer of information or of knowledge. Um, even coming, one of the other comments, and again, it might just be, it, it might not be across the board where they said, you know, it seems like scientists are making the decisions for what is good for us. We, in the, in the end, it's going to be a benefit. So therefore, we're making the decisions about what is good for society um, rather than society working with the scientists and determining, okay, this is the acceptable direction we, we want the science to go and having that social licence um, at, at the early stage. So I was kind of thinking, well, it kind of links back to that deficit model of how we think. Yeah, look, I've always been interested in priority setting in research, you know, from way back from medical research, right, you know, right through to now. And it's, it's a really problematic area because, you know, I mean, we're centre funded by the ARC as you are. So, you know, that's the government's made that decision. Ultimately, it's a, it's a government body that's made that decision. Presumably, it's based on its own priority setting, which, you know, I'm not sure what the, you know, what, how they actually choose their priorities by the time so by the time you get to the point where you might have some public input everything's already set the agenda's already set the methods are set the, you know and so forth it's really hard to engage the public in a meaningful way unless I think you start a process with something like citizens juries where you you know get put pulled together you know using rigorous methods a citizens panel or jury of some sort and say okay well we've got this technology synthetic biology we could use it for healthcare we could use it for the environment we could use it for you know transitioning away from animal based products for food you know what what would be what does the community want but we don't do that <laughs> It's like you, you, nobody's going to like hold up all the research for you know the six or twelve months it takes to pull together a citizen's jury and analyze the data and so on. So I, I just think we're very bad at engaging the public in an actual in a meaningful way. Um, 
I, I, yeah, I, I, but also I think the scientists, and this is a bit of a generalisation, but a lot of the scientists that I've encountered in the centre are really poor communicators. They don't, they, all they see is that little bit. They can't, they don't fit their research into any broader kind of social narrative at all. Um, and I think that's where we need to do a lot more training. Yeah, I think wherever fleet, whatever, if fleet gets up and does a fleet 2.0 of whatever, we're going to get into those, those spaces where we've got AI and, um, and quantum sort of stuff going on with crypto. I don't know, I, without getting into the details, there's a lot of um, interesting stuff there that I think whatever fleet 2.0 morphs into, we'll have to start considering, I think, in more detail because at the moment we are still very fundamental, I would th say, Matt. Um, and we're only just starting to think about uh, these, get our heads out of the, you know, spin orbital coupling and uh, and of the particular material we're looking at or the theory behind it and so forth and going, okay, where's this going to go beyond here? And uh, wherever we go next, I think we're going to have to think about more deeply on the, the ethics side of things stuff and the, what you've just raised here. Um, but that's uh, for people with get paid more than me to make decisions about. So, um, if anyone else has got questions, uh, hopefully we might have opened a can of worms. Got people thinking. I'd actually love to discuss more, but I'm afraid I have to go and uh, do some a revision session for some first year students. But uh, thank you very much, Wendy, for the talk. I thought it was really fascinating. So I really appreciate it. Yep, you're welcome. Thanks. Bye. See you, Bye. Matt. Anyone else? If there's no other questions, um, thank you very much, Wendy. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, I think, yeah, and people dropping out. So, yes, uh, we'll call it, we'll end it there. But, Wendy, thank you very much. I found it fascinating because it's right up my alley of the sort of stuff that I do and have done in the past um, in my own research and so forth. Uh, but, yes, thank you very much, guys. And we'll, uh, I think we'll see a lot of people that were here online again this afternoon for another seminar. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Wendy. That was really interesting. That was cool. Okay, thank you. All right. See ya. Thanks, Wendy. See ya. See ya.